be prepared to show your best work, but sometimes you, you know, like, well, this is my best work, I'm great, I'm ready, it doesn't really click with an editor. A couple of years later, you evolve, you've grown a little bit, you change your storytelling, maybe you've polished up your art style, show it to me again. I'm Joseph Coco. I'm at ALA 2018 in New Orleans, the annual conference. I'm here on behalf of Becky Hilburn's YouTube channel. Uh, we discuss art supplies and that sort of thing. So if you could introduce yourself, Carol. Uh, yes, my name is Carol Burrell and I am a new executive editor for Lion Forge's Cub House imprint, which is specializing in books for ages 8 and under, picture books, comics, beginner comics, more elaborate comics. and. Um, a little bit older than eight, but mostly eight and under. Okay. And I've probably read a few Line Forge books, but I don't always pay attention um, to the publisher quite as much as Becca does. Obviously, she's in the industry. Um, I saw that your batch said um, Diamond Books Distributions. So yes. is Line Forge actually a subsidiary of, of Diamond? No, we are our own company, but okay. we are just starting up. We're just expanding, so we're not as, as large and established as some of the other companies, although we're growing very fast. Okay. So um, we do distribution through Diamond and other channels. Of course. And um, we're participating in their big booth here at ALA. All right. But um, no, we are our own thing and Fantastic. Um, growing fast. <laughs> okay. And um, we were discussing earlier that Lion Forge has kind of a diversity type mission. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? The type of comics you uh, currently have uh, under the uh, your uh, publication and uh, some that are coming out in the works and maybe what you'd be interested in, in acquiring in the future, just the types of comics. Well, part of the company of Vision is specifically to for every reader to find a book that either represents them or what they love, what they want to read about, they want to be able to see themselves in it. Um, it's sort of our, our mission is, you know, comics for everyone, books for all people, um, whether that means, um, what, whatever diversity means, whether it means where you come from, what language your parents spoke, what you look like, um, any, anything really. We want people to be able to see themselves to okay. find stories they would enjoy. So are you are you targeting, um, like is your audience existing comic readers or just the, the public at large? Well, both actually. There's, okay. we, on the upper level, on the older level, we do um, issue comics, just comic books. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of things that may appeal to people who love superheroes or yeah. people who enjoy to be able to go into their local comic shop and pick up a book and follow a series. But then also there's a lot of graphic novels, middle grade books for kids who may already be interested in comics a little bit or just starting to get interested in comics. And when we get to the younger kids, whether they're eight, seven, six, pre-K, kindergarten, or nursery school, we want to provide them with very good picture books but also books that provide the tools that allow them to become more visually literate and mm -hmm. able to transition from a picture book into a comic book. Because as as we know, sometimes you'll get older readers or adults who just don't know how to read a comic because they just didn't read them. Yeah. And don't understand, okay, you've got to figure out where the balloons go and how the art works and how you go from panel and what happens in between those two panels. Yeah. And oh my gosh, the perspective changed. But we are looking to basically raise a generation of kids who have those tools. And it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, here's a page with one balloon, and when you're older you get a page with five balloons, but things like being able to look at a scene from different angles, or being able to understand yeah. the sequence, or how you read through the art. Things that um, a really good picture book will do for you anyway, but we want to kick that up a notch, and while they're enjoying the story, they're also Absorbing all sorts of, yeah, consuming the media and, and understanding art okay. and storytelling. Yeah, so you're just looking to acquire books like that that can be targeted um, just uh, in the age range of, of teaching children uh, the, the concept of comics, maybe something slightly more simple. Uh, and uh, what types of stories? Well, right now for my list in specific, Cup House, yeah. and because we're expanding so rapidly, we are looking for a lot. Okay. And so we're looking for anything that's a good story, honestly. It doesn't have to be this on the mission of, I am teaching comic book reading, but to have that in mind that um, these are kids who we do feel are going to transition from picture books into visual storytelling rather than that's sort of when I was a kid, when you turned 11, they'd give you your first book with no illustrations in it, and now you yeah. read prose. And, and that's, you're done and you with illustrations done. forever. And yeah. I thought, but I love comics, and I had to speak <laughs> them on the side. 
So, but so in our mind, that transition is going a different way. It's becoming more visually literate, and mm -hmm. the stories can be anything we want to have. All stories, like we say, a story for everyone. Um, whether it's you know cute little stories about animals, whether it's about real life, really realistic tales for kids. I'm not looking for a book that's oh, it's a message <laughs> and Tommy, clean your room and make your bed, or the monster will eat you. But if it's a story about hey, Tommy, there's a monster and you're going to go have an adventure and by the way, you know, the monster moved in next door and it's really the gym teacher or whatever, you know, it's, yeah. I, I thought it's I was a little more complicated. fun, yeah. a little whimsy, don't take kids for granted, don't assume that if you're six you need a story that goes from A to B and it ends. Kids have a lot of depth to them that I think sometimes we forget. When we get older, I think of books like Where the Wild Things Are, is like the quintessential storytelling, it's about his emotions, how he feels of working through stuff while he goes on this really complicated adventure with these characters who are all complicated in themselves and have their own emotional thing going on. Sure. So stuff like that really appeals to me and also if it's a stuff about you get in a spaceship and you go have an adventure in another galaxy, I'll take that too. So. Alright, that's good to know. Um, so what's bringing you to ALAC? This is a massive conference. Oh, yes. Obviously uh, you could spend days and days and days here and still not be sure what you're trying to get accomplished. <laughs> so uh, did you have a specific goal in mind? Are you trying to get more librarians to have comic books in their library? Are you trying to promote your existing books? Are you trying to recruit new talent for your imprint? It is all it's, of the all of the above. Okay. Um, it's we do want more librarians and teachers to use books in classroom use, have them in the library, have them both for entertainment for the kids who just want to come in and read a book, but also see things that um, they can use in um, curriculum. Like say a lot of kids yeah. get sent to the library, so you need have now's the time to write a, a book about a biography. So you have the option of your typical picture book biography or maybe it's a graphic novel biography, just a lot of variety that they might be able to um, use in the classroom, use in the library, or more options. Um, a lot of teachers and librarians now, they've grown up in a more comics-friendly environment, so they are looking to have a more variety of types of books available to kids or have them in the classroom. And do you find librarians know how to, how to find those things? Like, when you talk to a librarian, do they know where to go to find independent comics about all these variety of things, or do they only read, do they only purchase things from, like, School of Library Journal's top ten picks. Well, that's we, like that. we need to outreach to a lot of librarians. The ones who will come to us are the ones who are already really engaged with that format. Right. And um, in some of my other jobs, and hopefully here as well, what I do is a lot of presentation to the librarians who are the buyers and the book buyers and the school teachers who are the buyers from the school libraries to introduce them to comics that they may not be aware of just yeah. how cool they are or what neat art there is or what interesting stories are out there or the variety. To just raise the awareness for the librarians and the teachers who are sort of off their radar or they haven't been able to advocate for it because they don't really know what to say about it. So there's so many librarians and teachers here around us that there's a whole variety of folks, some of who are, are just out there looking for comments and others who they wouldn't even stop at our booth. Yeah. So that's what we want to do as a company because it benefits all the other publishers to be able to um, help folks know um, what these books are and that they are quality and that they are good storytelling and that some of them are even educational and they will teach you about science or dinosaurs or how to make cool things. And um, so we, we are going to do a lot of outreach and Lion Forge, because it's relatively new and we want to establish our presence and make people know what we're doing, make sure they know what we're doing, they are bringing all the editors to all the conventions to walk around and talk, to see the artists who are out here. We are really interested in seeing who's doing cool stuff, who maybe have done it, um, mini comics or an artist alley. We want to find the talent who have enthusiasm yeah. and, and want to find a bigger audience for what they're doing. Okay. And is ALAC the, the regular type of show that Lion Forge goes to, or do you hit up all the independent comic conventions and the big comic conventions? Definitely, like what? Okay. Yeah, definitely the big ones. Yeah. I am the sort of person who will go to all the small ones. If I can get myself there, I will sure, go. Sure, you're going to fly out to Michigan I will go, oh, yeah. get ATCAP or whatever. Down yeah. in Texas, up at MICE and MECAP, yeah. and anywhere Fantastic. I can get myself. Um, because I love it, and I want to see what everybody's doing. I want to see that energy. I yeah. love mini comics. I love folks who are just like, okay, I'm just going to staple together. I'm not going to the printer. Here's my raw thoughts. Um, and just um, 
seeing folks who have a story to tell. Or even if they're like, well, I haven't finished my first sequential book yet, but here are all my prints. And I'm like, oh, that art is spectacular. You've got to do sequential. Um, yeah. Some folks are like, I don't want to do sequential. But <laughs> other times there is that. <laughs> but so, so, yeah, I think that for Lion Forge, we as the individual editors are going to go out there and see folks who can't come and get a booth at San Diego Comic Con. But for us as a company, we do want to represent ourselves at Book Expo and New York Comic Con and San Diego Comic Con and Denver and hopefully Angoulême in France. And right. So people should be able to find you. So if people, they just yeah. They can. They will find you. So you will be out there. Okay. All right. And in terms of uh, um, an artist approaching you, I know we were talking earlier. Uh, you said you you love minis. Uh, so is it appropriate for an artist who is aspiring, has a rough idea, maybe some mini comics and things like that? Uh, to pitch to you with a mini comic, or um, uh, is it better for them to just go through uh, online, reach out to you an email? Like, what's the best way for somebody to to try to uh, convey a story idea that they're hoping to, to get published um, through through uh, uh, line? Well, if I'm at a convention, absolutely. Just if if you can spare a copy of your mini or a flyer or something with your web address on it. Sure. I I love to get the minis. I love to sort of bring them back in a little box and put them on my desk yeah. and go through and say, oh wow, this art really appeals to me. Oh, this is, someone has a story to tell. Oh, it's only eight pages long. I wonder if they want to do it eighty pages long. So for me, that's that's sort of the encapsulation, context. yeah, of of just whatever you feel is your best work that yeah. you can show. I do want to see it. I'm very eager to find art that speaks to me, speaks to the company. Of course, I just love to read it myself because I'm a fan of it. Um, reaching out to me online, um, through the company, just make sure that you do have a, a portfolio that I can look at and yeah. see your Something sequential art. See, professional. Yeah, see what you're actually doing mm -hmm. and be prepared to show your best work, but sometimes you you know, like, well, this is my best work, I'm great, I'm ready, it doesn't really click with an editor. A couple of years later, you evolved, you've grown a little bit, you've changed your storytelling, maybe you've polished up your art style, show it to me again. Okay. And if we, for me personally, I can't speak to all the editors, but definitely for me, if you're at a convention in Lion Forge, has a booth, hand them a, yeah, stop by, hand them an envelope, I might not be at the booth because the marketing and sales folk, they run things, the editors are in the way, we're knocking books over, or bags are everywhere, we're sitting on the yeah. floor, they want us out. But if you bring a little envelope with your samples and your website address or a little yes, mini, just I'll have them hold it for me, put it in the box and okay. send it to me. And at a lot of the places I've worked, that's always been our policy is drop something off. We will, I will look at it yeah. no matter what. I, you may not hear from me, but yeah. I will promise you, you that I've looked I'm at sure it. I'm sure you have hundreds of emails being an editor, so and we, I'm we sure that can get conversation. And, and you don't have to have an agent. I mean, having an agent means that, yes, I am going to get back to your agent. Because we will, we will respond to the agents because they, they are able to sort of start to figure out what is my taste, what is the other editor's taste, what is it that we seem to like the most. So they will start to tailor what they're sending us. So right. we are very attentive to agents. Right. But most of the cool stuff I found did not come from agents. Just mostly going up. I went up to Mice in, in Massachusetts. and. I ran into someone doing this cool comic about cooking and fancy, and I loved it, and that's all it really took. Awesome. Uh, so you said Cup House does children's books and comics. Yes. Um, I was wondering how, when, when you're looking to acquire things uh, and get stories pitched, how separate are those two things? Is it the same uh, group of people, or do you have someone that focuses on children's books and someone else oh, focuses within on the graphic novels? Itself? Yes, within the company. It's, well, at my level, which is the youngest books we're doing right now, there are, any editor can bring anything at any age range. So if you okay. see a Lion Forge editor and you know that they do YA, you can bring them a picture book. And if they love it, they will bring it to meetings. and say, I want to do a picture book. Right. But for me in particular, because my age range goes from like zero to eight, basically, I am going to look at picture books. I am going to look at a book like... Um, Elephant and Piggy, where there's going to be like a word balloon, mm -hmm. but it's basically a picture book. I'm going to look at the sort of things that, um, like um, Sleepless Night for a second, or those early tune books, yeah. um, where it's a couple of simple panels and a couple of balloons. So yeah, it's, it's like the that four whole, to six age range. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's that the whole gamut. If it 
fixing something that a child is going to love and enjoy, or even like the traditional picture books that you find from some of the really boutique publishers, like a Clarion Books or Candlewick or something, where it's just a beautiful painted page and some lines of text in your very traditional picture book style. There's really no limit at Lion Forge right now. Okay. As the age range gets older, we future transition into graphic novels. Um, and then you think of um, Princess in Black, if you're familiar with Shannon Hale's book, where it does combine some text and some sequential. Yeah, but a little bit more. <laughs> right. A little bit more sequential than that. And, and then, like I say, as they get older, we are focusing on graphic novels, on comic issue comic books, superhero stuff for the older readers and the grown-ups. Um, after a certain point, we are just looking for comments. Okay. But, but there's a lot of flexibility at the end, right? Right. So I forgot to mention, uh, you're not actually local to New Orleans. You're flying out from the D.C., was it? Well, actually, oh, New York America. City. New York City. New York. Okay, fantastic. Um, um, so what's your experience been like uh, coming down here? Um, I assume your, your company took care of the, the majority? Yes, yes. They, they put me in a lovely hotel, and I didn't have to think about that. Yeah. And um, I've, I've been to Louisiana a few times. I have a friend in Baton Rouge, and we would drive into New Orleans and get out and we'd go into a fancy restaurant where I guess yeah. her dad knows the people. So we get oh, to yeah. this <laughs> really fancy places, and then we get back in the car and we go back to Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know New Orleans at all. And I got here a day early, and I've been walking around. It's extremely hot because I am from extremely far north. <laughs> yes. Um, and and also very humid. Although yesterday wasn't as humid, so you I guess say that's good. This. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I was. It was. It was not a climate that I'm accustomed to being in in sure, any way whatsoever. Sure. But I, I got here and I woke up in the morning and I looked out the window and there was all uh, Canal Street in front of me and the French Quarter was over there and I thought beautiful. In New Orleans. Yeah. I can't believe I'm here and I'm not just running into a restaurant and running back out and trying to be polite to the my, my friend's yeah. father and her grandfather. I'm <laughs> actually in the city and darn it, I may be hot and the humidity might be nothing I've experienced before in life, but I'm going to get out and I'm going to walk around and see this. It's like it's magical and I think that I mean, maybe people feel that coming to New York City for the first time, but I just take that for granted because I grew up there. Yeah. But I, I feel like I've just been transported into something you dream about coming and seeing. So. Yeah. Well, people do, when they talk about New Orleans, they either talk about culture, drinking, or music. So uh, yes. um, I feel like New York does a larger gamut of things that people will think of New York as. So I maybe, think so. maybe that's it. There's like an iconic view of New Orleans when you come here. But I'm glad to hear, other than the heat, that it's been a good experience for you. I, I will continue to complain about the heat constantly. That's, look, Louisiana <laughs> people complain about the heat as oh, well. Okay. So it is. <laughs> It is fine. But I'm, I am just, I have been waking up every morning just kind of being thrilled to be here. Okay. Um, so, and would you have any advice to um, editors who are coming to ALA AC for the first time? Maybe not specifically in New Orleans, I know it goes all over America. Well, certainly just walk around and see everything. Um, yeah. There's a lot of insight into what librarians want, their needs, they're going to panels and hearing about what they're looking for, what's important to them, and how they handle book collections, how they spread the word. They're obviously all advocates of reading, literacy, of books, of information, and not just like stopping at the booths for the artists and the other publishers, but I've been trying to see the exhibits and specifically talking to and speaking to the libraries and kind of listening in and eavesdropping and some of the vendors are talking to the librarians and um, we're, we should all be partners and advocates together for books, for reading, for art, for storytelling yeah. and, and also trying to you know, find out do librarians want people to come in and do storytelling or do workshops, do art workshops, what, what do they need in their libraries, what, what is underserved, what would help them, how can we as publishers work with them. So an, an ALA is really useful for that or some of the teacher conferences even more so than the comic cons and the book expos right. where we're kind of in our own little bubble of this is where we're comfortable this is what we do these are our folks mm -hmm. um, so Cubhouse and Line Forge reaches out to uh, libraries and schools and that sort of thing in order to, to help promote the, the books that you cover yes we have new staff we're growing and our new staff are very much focused on that outreach to schools and libraries school libraries yeah, so you're not only getting things in the stores, you're also trying to get them in the library. That is a definite push for us, and I came from a publisher where their major market was the institutional market, schools, school libraries, and libraries. 
so that's very familiar to me. Sure. And we want to cover that as well with Lion Porch because we want to be the sort of books that libraries want to give the kids and that um, the sort of books that the school libraries would want to make available to their kids. That's, that's a real, not, not just to you know, sell a lot of books, that would be lovely, but we want to have the sort of books that they want. Okay. And finally from... Uh, Oh, also, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, you're also an artist. I am an artist. I do I do sometime webcomic. It's been on a hiatus for a long time, but I came to New Orleans and I started drawing again. So once Fantastic. again, yeah. um, it is called SPQR Blues. Okay. It is set in ancient Rome. It's kind of a soap opera in ancient Rome. And I, I did a Kickstarter. It was the most difficult thing I've ever done. Sure. I, I will. It's good to see you've experienced that camera. side. Okay. There are still folks who haven't gotten their books. There are a giant stack of books on my desk at home when I get back from this that are going out to folks who haven't gotten them because it was, it was hard. Yeah. It was not what I expected. Distribution is not an uh -oh. easy thing to do. Yeah. Books, books were destroyed. Books came back. The post office picked them up and they never arrived anywhere. I had to get more. I printed in Denmark. I had to have more books shipped over from Denmark. Wow. Um, it was exciting. Um, and it's been a really long process. And I admire, I have nothing but admiration for all those artists who do it on the regular. They get them out. People like Spike Trotman. She's just like, I chicken, you know, wake up in the morning, do a Kickstarter, send the books out the next day. I don't know how she does it. Um, and, and folks who don't have that sort of big elaborate experience will get out there, get their books done, get them sent. I admire that strength that the writers and artists do. And anybody who's done that should come talk to me if they want to either convert their Kickstarter into something distributed by a publisher or do a new idea with a publisher doing handling all of that because I think being able to accomplish that I now really appreciate how hard my fellow artists and creators have worked to be able to do that sort of thing. Okay. So Lion Forge takes um, existing books that were self-published? Uh, yes, we do, okay. actually. Um, awesome. We do. We look at web comics. We love to see a web comic that's really accomplished. Yeah. Um, really nicely put together. But also folks who have done a Kickstarter or done a, a minute or come to just pick it up and come to an SPX or something. And, you know, the audience is limited um, when you're distributing it yourself and you're just yeah. trying to get the word out yourself. And as a publisher, we have access to all the distributors. We have access to the, the wider market. One thing that Lion Forge does, which I'm really thrilled about, is that every book, every single book gets a certain, gets a certain marketing a budget, mm -hmm. certain marketing attention just built in. We're not going to publish it and just let it walk off on its own yeah, in the catalog, whatever, you'll find it. And that's yeah. something you're up front with, with the artists and the writers beforehand Abs before all this gets... Oh, yeah. absolutely. We will tell you up front, we are going to promote your book. Yeah. We have built that into the process. It Which is isn't to say important. the artist isn't also responsible oh, for yeah. promoting we're, the book. We're going to bring you, <laughs> we're going to make you come to New Orleans and be yeah, in the... Yeah, yeah. the freezing cold convention center and, <laughs> and promote your book but we we love to bring people out and feed them a little bit and then have them do a signing and show why they wanted to do this book and why they loved it so that's and, uh, what was the inspiration for your your web comic? oh goodness did, um, did you did you start as a comic artist and then get into the um the whole um editing or uh, yeah, I guess so. From okay. like very little, I've always loved comics. I'm you know one of those folks who can't remember when I first read a yeah. comic. Um, at one point, well, I was I was reading Prince Valiant because I didn't realize that comics could be something other than like Calvin and Hobbes style. Yeah, that's, and, that's a lot of people. And so, but Prince Valiant, oh, history and stuff. It's very old fashioned, but there's and and then I my mother gave me an issue of Love Plus, and that was it from there on. It Elfquest, it was Distant Soil, it was stuff by Roberta Gregory, so the really indie folks, Linda Barry, um, Julie Desay, and just seeing that people were telling whatever their story was, telling it themselves in the way they wanted, and I just always wanted to do a comic, and the luckiest, most wonderful stroke of luck in my life was to be able to become a comic book editor. And I kind of fell into that through children's books. I started in children's books, but I just always wanted to tell a story in sequential art and actually do a comic. And and I'm obsessed with ancient Rome. Absolutely obsessed with ancient Rome and history. Pitch okay. me history comics. I will look <laughs> at them. Um, so and I love soap opera. So Roman soap opera seem to make sense. I you keep sure. your emperors and your wars and your gladiators and your Russell Crowe's, I will just talk about people at home eating breakfast and, and how the toilets work. That's, that's what I will do. <laughs> it's understandable. Okay, so I mean, 
I guess it makes sense that you have those interests, so you just kind of married them together, and you're familiar with comics, so you're yeah, not producing and that. And uh, as far as publishing it on the web, uh, is that something you had planned to do from the start, or it was just like, well, I want to get this out to as many people as possible, and the web is the best way to do that? Well, it was kind of a, I guess at the time, it's just like everybody I knew was doing a blog, yeah. and there weren't, a lot, there were not a ton of web comics, honestly. Sure. And. It just seemed to be the thing that you did. Honestly, it wasn't a, a considered move at all. It was a, well, I want somebody to see it. Yeah. So I guess I'll put it on my blog. And I, I trans my blog sort of moved from being about movies I love and I'm really depressed today. I'm going to tell you all about it to you instead of being art. Before coming more for becoming more formalized and, and starting to use more of the formatting and clarity that we have in web comics now because I was just winging it. Uh, it was this. Is, <laughs> sure. And then eventually it turned into the regular webcomic in a real webcomic format. And I wasn't thinking about anything other than just drawing and being able to, to tell a story in art. And because I had that background in kids' books and love comics, that's how I ended up at a publisher that does kids' comics. Just because they, they needed a children's pub, um, editor to run the list, but they needed somebody who knew what a comic was. It was just, it was luck. It was absolute blind luck, and it was like I say, the best stroke of luck in my life. I think. Okay. And so where can we find your work online? You can find it at spqrblues.com. Okay. And, and we'll post that in the description yeah, that's below. Yeah, <laughs> And like I say, it's been on hiatus for a while, and I was learning how to use an you can iPad. You get lots of new readers now. Like, so I'm going to do perfect. digital, and then it looked weird, and so I'm going to go back to traditional okay. draw, drawn. I'm yeah. going to. Um, emulate um, seven inch para and <laughs> get into some watercolor and Sounds good. do some actual stuff on paper. Okay. And finally, would you have any advice to an artist who's considering tabling at uh, ALAAC? I mean, I know um, you're not tabling as an artist per se, but uh, hmm. from an editor's perspective, would you have any advice for artists who? who haven't tabled at ALAC before, but are considering coming. Well, I'm, I'm sure expense is going to be the first thing, is you know, be, be ready to make that investment. And if you're making yeah. that investment in the cost, be ready to tirelessly push yourself as folks come by. There's going to be librarians who might pick up your book. There's going to be teachers who might you know, want to tell their kids about your book and pick up bookmarks, have things you can give out. And every now and then an editor is going to come by and it's, going to be exhausting. I mean, that sort of self-promotion is exhausting, but you have the safety of being behind that table. Yeah. You have an agenda. You don't have to really wing it. Just have your 30-second your explanation, your elevator pitch <laughs> about what you do. Have something you can hand to somebody. There, a lot of people are just going to take it and walk away, but they'll have it in their hand and they'll look it up later, especially with a librarian um, crowd. They, they are collecting information. Yeah, they, they're not they just, like gathering. Yeah, yeah they're, they're not just taking it to follow be polite. They're going to follow up. <laughs> For a year, basically, until yeah. the next day at AAC. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so you know, you have stuff to sell, and, and you know, try not to be too disappointed if you don't turn over and turn around a lot of stuff to, to sell, but make connections and try to get out from behind the table and, and see the publishers, drop off the cards, see whose eyes light up when you say I'm an artist and, and pitch to them. I think getting out from behind the table actually is probably going to be important. Yeah, well. definitely. I've been encouraging Becca to do that. Yeah. So. <laughs> it, it may be it may be hard, but like I say, when you have have your script, have your handout, have your agenda in your head, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to wing it. Or if you're the type who loves to self promote, then just go out and call. Yeah, just talk to people. Yeah. All right. Well, Carol, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank I hope you. you have a great A L A A C. A L. Yes. Too many A's. <laughs> Thanks so much.